because for the first 10 years when you were born you were you are you are being raised by your parents is that correct and you just watch and observe what they say and do and things and you learn a lot from their behavior their phrases the words what they use if that is not enough then you are being outsourced to disney and nickelodeon and they teach you how to think probably or how to be happy when you're happy how should you act when you're happy or when you're sad how should you express when you're sad so a greater part of development of your mindset sometimes happen at that very tender age of the first 10 years then it's everything else what you experience but every point and turn every point of turn when you go to school college any place you go to it should always boil down to education which should be capable of allowing you to change how you think, how you behave, how you act, and how you enliven yourself with the greater degree of elevated states of consciousness. The information that you learn as a part of education is still very inadequate to change the way your mind performs and will attract right or wrong things in your life. Is that right? Because if you, if you look at people <coughs> in their day-to-day -day living and life, okay, we have created this whole material illusion around us which keeps us really busy running around like a headless chicken or a hamster on the wheel. I really like that analogy because it's keeping you busy. As the wheel is turning, your legs have to move. And as the legs have to move, the wheel keeps on churning. You don't know whether it's the legs of the hamster moving or is the wheel moving, which is keeping whom busy. But you look at your own life, you start your day like a crazy monkey and run around the whole day and then come back evening completely exhausted like a lazy dog. And then you are gone to a place of almost like a dead log for seven, eight hours thereafter and wake up and start it all over again. And by the time it's Friday night or Saturday morning, you realize, God, where I was, okay? The whole week has gone and you really don't know as if this thing is moving you or you are moving this thing. At what point we create a separation from our outside world with our inside world? That's the key. How do we create a gap which allows us to separate your outside world with our inside world. How do we change our inside environment to influence the outside environment? And it should happen at that junction points. It should happen at the junction point when we begin our day and when we end our day. Is that right? How many of you meditate? Good. And uh, is, it, is it the first thing in the morning you meditate or whenever you get some time or I, I heard someone I meditate when I drive and that's crazy. <laughs> okay. After I get a glass of water in the morning. That's good. That's a great time to do that. That's almost before you start your day. It's wonderful. Each day is different for me because of my schedule. So sometimes it's in the middle of the day, sometimes it's in the morning. Ideally move it to the morning because dawn and dusk these are the junction points of day and night okay and they are day and night of your life also because the night is ending and you're starting your day and the rest is ending and you're starting your activity so if you do it at 12 o'clock in the night it's not bad but it's a different kind of meditation because then you're already into that rajasic phase or the pitta phase of the day when the thoughts which are generated during that time are very different Okay, so ideally try to do it dawn and dusk where you do it before 5, 6, 7 in the morning and you do it 6, 7, 8 or 5, 6, 7 in the evening. And both of those things, they, they are almost like taking bath for your mind. Mm -hmm. It's almost like taking a bath for your mind because you have to wash your thoughts clean and so that you don't really go to work completely wound up and stressed out with not able to conserve your energy mentally and neither you should go to sleep with a lot of things hovering within your subconscious mindset and psyche and things like that which are creating even more weird dreams and incomplete rest and things like that. 
So ideally those are the junction points. But the question still remains is that when every experience is going to affect us in some way, is that right? In some way. Everything what you're listening to me right now is going to affect you some way. If it's going to be hot weather outside, it's going to affect you. If you eat something really heavy, it's going to affect you that way. If you really have a stressed out news you get just now from an email or someone called you and told you something, your body is going to be affected with the domino effect of that thought generating a cascade of molecular emotional pathways. Is that right? And what allows us to maybe stop somehow and, and regroup ourselves and allow it to move in a different direction? We talk about this all the time, that you are, you are walking very happily in a good mood with nice iPhone or I, I, um, headphones to your ears and you're listening to some nice music and you're just happy and you're walking by the roadside and you suddenly see a huge big snake under your feet and you're about to step on it and you, you are completely panicked because it's a huge thing, creature under your feet and uh, this whole happy state of your physiology is converted into you a sense of panic, fear, your throat becomes dry your blood pressure goes up, your heart starts pounding, you start sweating, your respiratory goes up, rate goes up, the adrenaline starts rushing, and everything in fractions of second, the state of physiology has changed from feeling happy to complete panic. Is that right? And it happens just like that. It happens just like that. And you try to grab your flashlight from your back pocket and see what it is in there, and you see, oh, it's not a snake, it's just a rope. It's a big rope which is there. and. Uh, Again, in fraction of a second, it just goes away. You just have a good laugh at it and you move on. So, if at all a simple fear or panic can alter the state of your body functioning from one way to another, which is almost involuntary without your control. Is that right? It's an involuntary action. If that can shift the way your physiology is functioning just like that in few seconds, can you imagine you doing a 10, 10 20 year job in a place where you hate absolutely go every morning, you hate to see the face of your boss, or you are in a painful relationship waiting it to end, or you are just there because you can't get out right now. Can you imagine that a constant stressful situation in your life, you name it, you will have it, cancer, heart rate, obesity, uh, all different uh, chronic diseases could happen because you are constantly triggering negative chemical responses to a toxic situation in life. And how can you prevent? Because when we say it's an involuntary thing, how can you protect yourself from not really happening an involuntary action which suddenly becomes very toxic for you? How can you go to a job and say that I know that I don't like this job, but how can I get used to it so that I don't constantly tell myself that I hate doing this, I hate doing this. Or how can I probably start shifting my awareness in that given relationship where I don't really kill myself telling I hate this, I hate this, I hate this all the time. And it's not just a pep talk. It's much more than a pep talk. Because even a good pep talk changes the way your body functions and is able to excel in its, in its ability to perform. Is that right? That's what you see all the athletes and coaches and everything telling the athletes, oh, you can do it, you're so good, you're the best, this, that, and then that guy does it. Is that right? So you are, you are creating something as a simple thought which changes the limitations of your physiological functioning. If a coach can do it, if an athletic director can do it, why can't a doctor do it? Why can't a doctor, why should not be a doctor using the same techniques of changing people's mind, psyche, emotional functioning, allowing them to understand the greater realities of life and move them onto the right path? Because <clears throat> from an Ayurvedic angle, diseases are not only organic. They are not what is going on to your body. 
they are all happening with your outlook how you look at life it's depending upon your outlook how you look at your life it is all about what bugs you in your response to every little thing why do you crave for certain things why you're addicted to certain things why you're so lazy why you're so heavy why you're so dull why is this that all those things which are going on into your mindset we use the term adhi and vyadhi adhi has to do with mental emotional psychological components which are disturbed and vyadhi is when they translate themselves into a physical component that's when you talk more about it and what is to be done so What's the second word uh, adhi and vyadhi Adhi is mental and Vyadhi is physical. So <clears throat> you have to al always create a distinction where this Adhi doesn't become a Vyadhi, where this emotional psychological component do not get translated into a physical or physiological challenges. And many times we meet people here. Okay, here they are with completely stressed out. having hyperacidity heartburn gastric ulcer an autoimmune condition and everything and now with host of different symptoms 1 2 3 and 4 we are trying to allow them how to think which is so difficult for people or how to control your anger or how to look at your existing relationship with positivity or how to look at money and things like that many times it's so difficult to bring these changes and you have to do these changes in a 7 minute of standard consultation what a doctor spends with a patient it's impossible it is impossible to change those people how they have drifted from here to slowly over here that has taken a lifetime for that hypertension to be built in there it has taken a lifetime before that kidney has crumbled into a partial renal failure or before an autoimmune disease has happened and now you are trying to address the core component so the basis of prevention is how can you take care of your mind take care of your mind and how can you take care of your body by aligning yourself with something called as spirit okay so if you look at this triangle of mind body and spirit you can't really take care of only mind you can't really take care of only body you have to bring in the spiritual component to take care of both of them at once otherwise it's not possible otherwise here you go to a surgeon or there you go to a shrink Uh, here you go to a doctor there you go to a psychotherapist it doesn't matter i see so many people who are running from pillar to post from one doctor to this psychotherapist to psycho counselor and everything and it doesn't work until and unless you bring in the third and the most core component of your life which is a spiritual being and connect yourself to that heightened state of awareness and elevated state of consciousness you will be struggling in order to look <clears throat> Let's look at it a little bit more in detail. Okay, imagine that when you bring a spiritual component in your life, it doesn't mean that you are you are wearing a fancy cross in your neck or you are you are having a, a mark on your forehead. It doesn't have to do anything with spirituality. Religion has nothing to do with spirituality. Is that right? Is it a very debatable point? How many of you believe that religion is all about spirituality? Jose, I, I'm not a religious person, but I, I, I consider myself a very spiritual person. So okay. that's a good thing. What do you think? I think that sometimes in religion, people go through motions and don't realize even why they're doing them. That's good. That's zombie. Um. 